So hello and welcome to the third presentation in the SciWEM Northern Ireland webinar series. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel Hogan and I am the chairman of SciWEM Northern Ireland. So the purpose of uh, this lunchtime webinar series is to complement our 2020-2021 technical programme with uh, my programme theme for the year, which is Water and the Environment Adapting to Change. So today we are joined by Warren Bowl, and I'm sure many of you know Warren Bowl as being the 33rd chairman of SciWeb Northern Ireland. Uh, but Warren is here today in a, a different with a different hat on. Warren is here from Amy Consulting. So he's a technical uh, director within Amy Consulting uh, based in Belfast. Uh, he has over 25 years experience of drainage and flood risk management from both a client and a cons consultant perspective. Uh, Warren is the technical lead for Amy, uh, who are the sole consultancy framework suppliers for to DFI rivers and flood risk management services in Northern Ireland. So today Warren will be discussing the second cycle of the Northern Ireland flood risk management plan 2021 to 2027. So this plan is currently out for public consultation and um, it, it'll highlight the flood risks or flood hazards and risks from rivers, the sea and surface water and sets out how the relevant authorities will work together and with local communities to manage flood risk. Uh, so this, as I said previously, the, the reports are currently out for public consultation and the information is available on the infrastructure-ni uh, website. Uh, so before we start, I would like to highlight some points of housekeeping. This event has been recorded and assuming there are no copyright issues, the recording will be made available on the SciWEM website uh, under the event <coughs> page and also on the SciWEM YouTube page. If you experience any technical issues and need assistance, please use the chat feature on Zoom to let us know what the problem is and what help is required. Uh, we'll be taking all questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom and I'll get and I'll read them out at the end um, at the end of the presentation. But if you want to be getting questions in as we go, that would be OK. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Warren. Thanks, Dan. OK, we're up to 95 now. I think that's more than enough people giving their lunch up. So very good. Um, as Daniel says, I'm Warren Bowell. I'm a technical director of Amy in Belfast. And we were called upon by the Department for Infrastructure um, to support them in developing the Northern Ireland Flood Risk Management Plan. Um, and in doing this, we then also um, subconsulted in JBA. Um, and I've told the girls in JBA that I will give them a shameless plug as well. So uh, a, a lot of, as, you, as we go through this, you'll see um, the quality of the graphics the girls have produced. Um, so big thank you to Hannah Coogan, Thomasina Sayers and Hannah Bishop for all their help on this. So without any further ado, let's make a start. There's a bit of shameless uh, publicity for me. Uh, so we're talking today about the, the second cycle draft Northern Ireland Flood Risk Management Plan, uh, 2021 to 2027. Um, this comes on the back of the Floods Directive, um, and it's a, it's a cyclical program of improvements that we look at in assessing flood risk. So um, you can see here the <coughs> draft plan, which as Dan says is out for public consultation. And on the front cover, we have a lovely photograph of flooding in Portadown. Um, so the legislation, um, the European Floods Directive was transposed into Northern Irish law by the Water Environment Floods Directive Regulations Northern Ireland 2009. And ultimately this is set up to create a framework for managing flood defense and the consequences of against human health, the environment, cultural heritage, and economic activity. So as I said, it's a, it's a six year cyclical program. So you start off with a, a flood risk assessment. Then in the middle section, you're improving your data collection, um, you're, mopping, you're mapping and you're modeling. And ultimately it then leads to a, a flood risk management plan. So we've been through the first cycle already and actually the flood risk management plan we have now that we're talking about today is the end of the second cycle. So 
For the second cycle, we've done the Northern Ireland Flood Risk Assessment 2018, and we've done improvements to flood hazard and risk mapping, um, looking at the significant areas of flooding. So the first cycle plans, which run from 2015 to 2021, were done for the three river basin districts that are covered in Northern Ireland, the Northwestern, the Naban, and the Northeastern. Um, incidentally, in the Naban, we have more photographs of Porta Down flooding in a different event, um, which again reinforces the need for looking at flood risk management. So as I said, the second cycle kicked off in 2018 with the, the NIFRA. Um, and when the first cycle was done, we'd looked at flooding from rivers and flooding from coastals. Um, the second cycle, we've taken on board surface water flooding, but also we're looking at the effects of existing flood defenses and culverts and how that will change the impact of flooding and the areas at risk. So in the original um, flood risk management plan, there were 20 what they called significant flood risk areas. Now, NIFRA, with the additional modeling, revised that, and, and we came out with what we call 12 areas of potential significant flood risk. And it's, it, it is really just a, a change in the name, but it also reinforces the fact that it's a slightly different analysis that's been done. We also then created what we call transitional areas of potential significant flood risk. Um, we have nine of those. And effectively, those nine areas were significant flood risk areas in the first cycle plan, um, but didn't meet the threshold for the second cycle. So the second cycle plan has a threshold of one million pounds of aggregated annual average damages. And that was deemed as as a significant extent of flooding um, for somewhere the size of Northern Ireland. So the observant among you will realize that um, the 12 APSFRs and the nine TAPSFRs make 21. So we have an additional site that's come in as a result of this second cycle analysis. And that's actually LARN, uh, which has jumped the way up the, the rating. So if we look at Larne, there's not really much fluvial flooding. There's a, there's a little bit in around the centre of town and, and the Glen Arm Road stream, but, but nothing significant. Um, it is a coastal town, so you know, we would expect a bit of tidal inundation, and, and there is quite a bit of tidal inundation in and around the Harbour State. Um, the Harbour State in Larne is reclaimed land, and... Yeah, it's perfectly flat and, and you sort of look at it and think, well, once the flood water comes out, it will spread across it. But the actual buildings are all elevated above the flood level. Um, and that's as a result of planning. So really in the first cycle, there wasn't an awful lot. Um, but in the second cycle, when we've started looking at surface water flooding, what's apparent is Larn, quite urbanized, very steep catchment. And, and what you get is rapid runoff. And, and that's resulted in quite significant surface water flooding, particularly in and around the center of the town. So when we look at the level of damages, um, you'll see, as I say, in the original iteration of the plan, tidal and fluvial, not significant levels of flooding or damage, um, but the surface water creates a huge spike. And, and that's what's actually, um, transported LARN into one of the APSFRs. So, so we have 12 APSFRs, which are spread throughout Northern Ireland. And, and we also have the transitionals. So these APSFRs are the sites that we then focus on for the second cycle plan um, and look at those in more detail. But, but as we've progressed into the second cycle, we've looked at improvements in the flood modeling so these are actually all contained on Flood Maps NI, which you can access online. And so what we've done is in the first cycle plan, it was primarily strategic flood mapping that was used. So um, this is ported down and this is Craig Avon. So because of the extensive flooding problems in ported down, 
there's now a detailed flood map for the area through Portadown. But Craig Avon historically hasn't had significant flooding, and that's simply been left as the strategic level flood map. We've also produced flood risk mapping, which effectively looks at the level of damage created by the flooding. Um, again, there's nothing shown for Craig Avon because there's, there's not significant flooding. But through Portadown itself, you can see some of the um, some of the areas which are creating greater flood risk. Uh, again, the boxes that are empty, it doesn't mean there's no flood risk. It, it just means it's sort of one to five K on an annual basis. But you'll see the the more significant flooding in around this sort of area here. We take into account the center of town and Ulster carpets and places like that. So that's been used. Again, it's, it's, it's almost it's a tool that allows people to actually identify where the significant risk is. As I say, we've also looked at surface water flooding in this iteration. Now, very much in, in the same way in the first cycle plan, we had strategic flood maps for rivers and coastal flooding. Um, in the second cycle, when the surface water flooding has been taken forward, it's been taken forward as a strategic level map, which covers the whole of Northern Ireland. As we progress into the third cycle, there will then be more detailed surface water mapping that will be done for the areas of, of significant flood risk. Climate change also plays a significant part in our understanding of flood risk. And, and again, here in Balamina, <clears throat> we've run the climate change scenario as well. Now, in Northern Ireland, we've adopted the medium probability 2080 epoch. And finally, in improvements in mapping and modeling, um, they've now produced a set of reservoir inundation maps. Um, and again, it's quite stark. You know, these maps are based on a, a, a total failure of the reservoir embankment. So they are quite stark. Um, but it does give an indication of areas that would potentially be at risk. So moving forward, there are a number of bodies in Northern Ireland who actually have a role to play in flood risk management. We have the um, DFI Water and Drainage Policy Division. They're responsible for taking forward flood risk management policy and also implementing the floods directive work. DFI Rivers undertake the maintenance of designated water courses. Um, we refer them to designated water courses. So if you're in England, you would talk about main river and ordinary water course. So effectively for a designated water course, read main river. Um, so they're, they're responsible for the maintenance of designated water courses. They're also in, responsible for the inspection of sea defenses and fluvial flood defenses, the capital program of flood protection works, managing the modeling and mapping, they're a statutory consultee for the planning authorities on flood risk. They liaise with the Met Office as far as flood warnings and weather warnings go, and they're the lead government department for the strategic coordination of flooding emergencies. DFI roads maintain the roads and the related drainage systems. They manage their program of highway drainage improvements, and they also deal with the impacts of flooding where people are flooded from highway drainage. Northern Ireland Water provide the water and sewerage services across Northern Ireland. And, and again, they provide the, the maintenance of the surface water, the foul and combined sewers. They have a program of sewer improvements. And, and again, they deal with the impacts of flooding from their sewers. DFI Planning, they prepare the regional development strategy. And they look at the Northern Ireland wide planning legislation and policy. And they also scrutinize the councils who now pr produce their own local development plans. The councils themselves, in addition to taking on that role of producing the local development plans, they process the planning applications. They're also responsible for emergency planning and have a role in that emergency response. So these are the organizations that play a leading role in flood risk management in Northern Ireland. One of, the, one of the things that came out of the first cycle plan um, was a need to have a more formalized facility 
for the cooperation and interaction between the bodies in responding to flood emergencies. Now, it's not to say that there wasn't any interaction before, but this is really just more of a, a set of forums that allow, allow the experts to get together and, and look at where there are opportunities for shared wins. So there are an awful lot of acronyms and we're not gonna go through them all now, but the one that we're talking about today is the Flood, Floods Directive Technical Stakeholder Group. They effectively support the delivery of the second cycle plan. Um, they're also involved in providing advice, guidance, and recommendations on policy. And they're made up of members from WDPT, Rivers, Roads, NI Water, DERA, and the Living with Water project, which is an umbrella project. So in the flood risk management plan itself, again, we've said, you know, the objectives of the plan are looking at human health, economic activity, environmental and cultural heritage. And, and really managing the impact on those four key elements. So how do we actually do that then? We have a set of, of flood risk management measures within the plan, and those are basically looking at prevention, protection, and preparedness. And that will relate to you know, the prevention is more of a planning, element where it's about, firstly, you'd say, when you talk about flood risk management, you talk about new developments, not being at risk of flooding, but not exacerbating flood risk elsewhere. And that's really what this is focused on. So we're keeping the development outside of the flood risk areas. And with the enhancements and the flood mapping that have been done as part of the flood risk management strategy, that then bolsters the support for the planning services. There will always be exceptions where a development must happen. Um, and when those happen, we need to make sure that those developments have flood resilience. <clears throat> now, it may be something like a like football changing room, but simply, you know, if you're going to put a football changing room in the floodplain by the football pitches, well, you're going to have to think about non-return valves and toilets. You're going to have to think about moving the electrics above flood level. So all of these things are taken forward in supporting that development role and preventing loss compared with flood risk. So coupled with that, we then have surface water management and a sustainable drainage systems, which again are about not exacerbating flood risk elsewhere. So the protection, this, this to me is what I would traditionally call the flood defense element of it. It's the maintenance of the existing defenses and networks. Now, where we say defenses, you can also read sewers, you can read surface water drainage systems, road drainage, everything. So it's that maintenance activity that's taken out by all, taken over by all the organizations. We have new flood alleviation schemes. Uh, again, in the photographs, you can see the construction and the completion of part of the East Belfast flood scheme at Conswater. And we also now have catchment-based natural flood management. Now, back in the good old days, when we started doing flood risk management strategies, you always had a natural flood management solution in there, something about reforesting the upper catchment and managing land use. But ultimately, you would get through the strategy and you would get to the end and say, it's a lovely idea, but it'll not solve the flooding problem now. It'll solve it in 20 years or 30 years time. So our preferred option will be to build the flood defense. And, and the catchment, the natural base stuff, that kind of just got forgotten. There's now more of an onus on that. <clears throat> and ultimately, the idea is for the catchment based work is that that's something that will progress during the life of existing flood defenses. And, and ultimately, it'll be in place when those defenses need replaced, but it'll also help with the climate change impacts and managing those as, as time progresses. And finally, preparedness. Because it's not always possible or um, justified to build a flood defense, we do need to look at actually supporting the public 
<clears throat> once flooding happens. And this, this preparedness, it looks at the flood and emergency planning, um, which is done um, by the council and by the other organizations. Flood warnings and information, which are led by DFI Rivers, community engagement, building and resilience. And that's, that's really about making sure the public are aware of what they need to do when the flooding starts to occur. And, and it may also be a matter of providing sandbag storage in the local community. So communication about flood risk, individual property level protection is a scheme that's being pushed forward by DFI Rivers at the moment. And this allows individual residents um, to apply for individual property level protection to be constructed at their policy, at their, at their property. So that will be things like flood boards or flood doors, um, non-return valves on their sewers, um, tanking of the walls. That will generally protect properties up to about 600 mil or so. Um, and as part of that scheme, the residents actually contribute 10% up to a value of 10K. So again, it's a worthwhile scheme for people where we don't think we can justify a flood scheme, um, or if a scheme is going to happen, but it's going to happen 10 years down the line, um, then it's a way for individuals to protect themselves. Uh, and finally, you know, after the flooding, again, we need to work on the flood recovery and the welfare of the, the local residents. So these are all elements that come into the preparedness. And, and again, all, all the bodies in Northern Ireland who have an involvement in flooding, again, will play an important role in this. So within the second cycle flood risk management plan, we have our APSFRs, our areas of potential significant flood risk. So within these, because these are the areas where we know the highest level of damage is going to occur, the plan is more focused on those. Um, and we'll do a, there's a separate section in there for each of them. Provides a little bit about history of flooding, an overview of the catchment, the geology, the sources of flooding, current flood risk mitigation, and then the actions from the first cycle plan, how have they been achieved? Uh, and ultimately, we'll come up with actions for the second cycle plan. So just as, as a way of a bit of a glimpse of that, this is, this is Newry. Um, and again, it's, you know, we, we look at the catchment. We look at the level of damages. <clears throat> now, we know Newry is in a bit of a bowl and, and the water courses all come down and have to go through the middle of town. So, you know, we're fully aware of the fluvial flood risk. Uh, tidal's not so extensive. Um, and the surface water plays a not insignificant part in the damage assessment now. So within the first cycle plan, we had actions in under protection and preparedness. The preparedness options, um, setting up local community resilience groups, and also the coastal emergency response plan, which was a, a Northern Ireland wide plan. Those have been completed. And the design of the Newry scheme, the flood scheme, which will take account of both the river and the coastal flooding is ongoing at the moment. So going into the second cycle, again, we have actions based on prevention and protection. The protection being the continuation of the flood alleviation scheme. It's actually out for tender at the moment for the first stage of that. And and will be on the ground by 2022. But within prevention, Northern Ireland Water have an action um, to produce an enhanced drainage area plan, which basically will set out mitigating uh, flooding from sewers within the town. And also the DFI rivers, again, will have an involvement with the local council as they develop their local development plan. So within the second cycle, Within the APSFRs, we set time scales, um, which we can we can then grade the actions against. So I suppose you're just gonna need to get down to the nuts and bolts of it in the vulgar side. Um, how much is actually gonna cost? And, and I think the thing is when you see these, it starts to become sort of mind-boggling the amount of money that's actually spent within Northern Ireland on flood risk management. Um, the damage assessments that have been done indicate an annual damage of about 56 million pounds a year 
uh, from flooding. Now that's not just within the APSFRs, that's that's over the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, but as I say, when we start looking through these figures, it, it all sort of comes back to gives you a scale of the, the, the scope of the work. Um, so in prevention, this is PAMU, this is the Planning, Advising and Modelling Unit from DFI Rivers. Um, and they support the local planning authorities giving, giving advice on fluvial flooding and flood risk to properties. So that's the sort of scale of budgets they have for the six year cycle. Within protection for DFI Rivers, we have the capital program and DFI Rivers have a 10 year capital program. So we have schemes within the 12 APSFRs and we also have schemes outside of those 12 APSFRs. And I think that's the thing to remember as well is where we talk about focusing their, our efforts on the APSFRs, we're not forgetting everything else. Um, so there are there are other schemes that will be progressing, things like Newcastle, which is ongoing, Straban, Downpatrick, they all fall within this area here of schemes that are outside of the APSFR. And again, you know, over the six year cycle, we're looking to spend 44 million pounds on schemes outside of the APSFRs. The homeowner flood protection scheme, I'd say that's actually proved very popular. And, and if you think for the properties, generally a cost will be in the region of about 10,000 pounds. So, you know, we're looking to protect 25 plus properties every year under that scheme. The stakeholder groups, which have been set up under the floods directive, again, we have a budget in there to continue that cooperation. So the maintenance, the, um, the everyday work that the guys do in the ground, <clears throat> we've got water course maintenance, road drainage maintenance, and sewerage maintenance. So that takes account of the, the maintenance oper operations for DFI rivers, DFI roads, and Northern Ireland water. Within roads, there's a structural drainage upgrade budget, which is in there. Now, they're not necessarily going out and digging up roads and replacing drainage. These will tend to be drainage improvements that are done as part of a wider road scheme. And then within Northern Iron Water, again, they have substantial budgets set aside. Um, so we have their DG5, which is where there's internal flooding of properties, stormwater separation, where we're trying to move away from combined systems to a foul and a storm system. SCAMP, which is Sustainable Catchment Area Management Practices in Northern Ireland. And the idea of that is to improve the quality and reliability of water through sustainable catchment-based solutions. And also then the drainage area plans, which will look at the hydraulic modeling of the existing networks and identify improvements. But finally, the Living with Water program. Now, I think Dan actually had a talk on the Living with Water program um, a couple of months back. So this is actually an integrated plan for drainage and wastewater management in Greater Belfast. And again, it, it, takes, it takes account of producing planning guidance, but also identifying blue-green infrastructure so we can have a, a more environmentally sustainable drainage system. Under preparedness, again, we have budgets for data acquisition, providing alert stations, so that we can provide better flood warning and also the preparedness, the emergency planning element. Preparedness continues on to local community engagement with the resilience groups. And, and also then there is a program for actually extending those resilience groups in the future. So I thought I would give you those rather than just putting this one chart up, but what this does demonstrate is that over the six year cycle that we're looking at, we're looking at spending 474 million pounds on flood risk management activities in Northern Ireland, um, which is a, a substantial investment. But we don't just look at the environment, uh, at the engineering side of these things. There is an environmental assessment that's been undertaken um, in parallel with the, the flood management side of things. And, and they've looked at a, a strategic environmental assessment and also a habitats regulations assessment at this strategic level. 
Um, obviously, as schemes go forward, they will then still have their own site-specific assessments undertaken. So monitoring and review. <clears throat> um, it may have, um, may have not missed your attention that uh, we're no longer part of the European Union, and therefore we don't actually report to the EU anymore. Um, but with the floods directive work, what we will be doing is setting up an annual reporting um, on the on the implementation of the plan. Um, and I think that's still to be decided. And, and that will come out in the final draft or in the final version of the report um, once the consultation period is over. So, but we are still fitting and working to the six year cycle. So the third cycle will kick off and again, we will re renew the flood risk assessment, which has got to be done by December 2024. Um, improvements to the flood hazard and risk mapping by December 2025. And that will you know, most likely involve um, reviews on climate change and, and also the surface water flooding, providing a bit more detail in areas of significant risk. And then the third cycle plan will be issued in December 2027. So as we say, consultation on the plan is ongoing. Um, this started um, just before Christmas last year, and it runs for six months. So please take the time to read the plan. Um, even if you're just flicking on to look at a, an APSFR that is of interest to you, um, you know, it, it's, it's useful for people to actually look at the plan and give a bit of feedback on it as well. Um, needless to say, the budgets that have been identified in this plan are still, still quite outlined and those will be firmed up um, in the next few months as well. The things like the Northern Ireland Water budgets, um, they were based on their PC21 application. And, and once that's being finalized, then again, Northern Ireland Water will be able to confirm what their spends are likely to be over the six year cycle. So consultation uh, responses by five o'clock on Friday the 25th of June, if you please. And that's really about it. Um, just to say a few thank yous, as I say, we have the Department of Infrastructure <clears throat> with ADERA, the Living With Water Programme, Northern Iron Water and JBA. And this really has been a, a whole team effort. Um, everybody's got involved in, in reviewing and giving comments and, and we've had you know, quite a number of reviews and iterations to get to the document we have today. So. Um, I commend the document to you and uh, I would ask you to go and uh, have a little read and see what you think and give your feedback. Great stuff, Warren. Thank okay. you. Very Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I suppose while everyone is uh, having to think about some some of the questions that uh, there's one in already, but if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A feature below. I suppose as, as uh, the chairman, I get to hit you with a couple of questions myself. Um, I suppose just I've two questions popped to mind. The first being, um, how comes the second one in a second? But how will schemes out of the, um, the APSFRs or areas of potential significant flood risk uh, be brought forward in the future? Well, the intention is that they'll come forward as, as just normal business. So, you know, where flooding problems are identified, uh, where flood events occur, um, they'll be identified as part of the, the normal inspection and operation. And they'll come forward in that manner. Um, so you'll see and, you know, you see in the plan, there is a substantial budget in there for capital schemes outside of the APSFR. And that's the intention that picks up those schemes. Um, what's shown there at the moment are the schemes that have already been identified in the capital program. So as to say, schemes like Newcastle, Downpatrick, Straban, um, those schemes will all progress. But again, like anything, they, they need a business case done uh, and they need a full appraisal done. So the business as usual, really. Very good. Um, another question that sort of comes to mind is you you had mentioned the three p's of uh, flood risk management measures that is 
prevention, protection and preparedness. Uh, I know NI Water uses similar three Ps, but we won't get into that one. But uh, in your opinion, what do you think or what do you see as the most important of the three Ps? Um, well, I, I suppose that would all depend on where you live. <clears throat> um, you know, if you're buying a new house, you'd like to think it's not at risk of flooding. Um, if you're in an area that already floods, you'd like to think there's going to be a protection scheme done. And, um, and if nothing can be done for you, then, you know, you'd like to think that the preparedness will be taken forward. But I, I think for me, the most critical one is, is actually the first one, um, the prevention, because, you know, we already have about 45,000 properties at risk in Northern Ireland. And, and that will only increase with climate change. So the idea of having prevention in there and preventing more properties going into the, the at-risk bracket um, makes sense. At least it gives us a fighting chance to actually defend the properties, the existing properties that are at risk. Oh, very good. Uh, I'll go to the open forum. There's a few questions have come through. Um... So I'll start off with the first one. Uh, do you think uh, current flood risk modeling methods used are suitable for urban areas whereby the interaction between fluvial and urban drainage are not representative? And do you think this will be addressed going forward? Is, is that question from Thomasina Sayers by any chance? No, Richard Reid. So. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the thing is when, when we look at the, the surface water flooding and in a lot of the APSFRs, there is actually quite a correlation between the surface water flooding outlines and what's shown as sort of minor water courses. And, and this is really to do with the sort of broad brush strategic approach that's been taken at the moment for the surface water flooding. You know, effectively what it does at the moment, it drops a load of water on the surface. And, and if it lands on a solid surface, it runs off quickly. If it runs on grass, it it uh, percolates in and then runs off a little bit. So there, there are improvements to be made in that, and, and we're fully aware of that. Um, but that will be undertaken in the second cycle, and the third cycle, sorry, um, for the improvements in the flood mapping and modeling. Uh, okay, perfect. And uh, moving on, uh, we've a question. Uh, how much reduction in flood risk in pound AAD do you expect uh, the next six years investment in flood risk to deliver? Will this keep pace with increases anticipated due to climate change so that over time we will see a net reduction in flood risk? God, that's a horrible question. <clears throat> Must have been seeing your uh, new members' papers competition, Judge. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, this, the strategy doesn't go into that level of detail at the moment. Um, it's maybe something that we can talk to the guys about. Um, if you think, you know, we, we have pro programs of investment that are, that are set there and, and there will be business cases for each of those schemes, probably at this stage quite outlined business cases. So it, it's very difficult to say how much um, reduction in damage we'll be creating. It's probably something more to do as a, a re retrospective at the end of the six year cycle. We can see how much was spent and we can see what's actually been provided for it. Okay, thank you. And I think of a few more questions. Um, of one from Jennifer Canifan. Uh, you had mentioned the authorities involved in NI, but did you encounter any issues with the APSFRs located in border catchments, for example, uh, in terms of accessing data or dealing with authorities in the Republic? Well, I think the thing to say now, I didn't bring it out in the in the report um, or in the presentation, but it, it's in the report. That, you know, there is a very good working relationship between DFI Rivers and their counterparts in OPW, and and certainly, you know, I know we're working on a scheme in Straban at the moment, and yourselves actually RPS are working in Lifford. So there is a lot of um, cross border cooperation that goes on, and I, I don't really see a problem with that. 
Uh, okay, and I'm going to take the last question uh, from Eugene Matlone. Um, is there a potential for identified areas for significant flood risk themes to be ruled out as not viable when an economic analysis is undertaken slash updated? Well, I think that will always be the case because <clears throat> although we've identified these areas of potential significant flood risk, once we go and produce a business case and produce a detailed design, you know, you will always be, be revisiting the damages. And, and yes, there, there may well be schemes that once you've started looking at surface diversions and, and um, geotechnical complications that the schemes might become unviable. So I think I think that's always something that that we run the risk of. Um, but again, that's part and parcel of developing flood risk management schemes. And and really, once we've produced the detailed designs and we've done the analysis, we'll do a final run over the economic business case. And and there will be cases where schemes just can't be taken forward. Thank you, Eugene. Very good. I think, uh, well, I don't know if it's me or you that's phasing out of it, but I think that's all the questions anyway that's come through. Thank you very much for your presentation and even answering the questions.